Is it a baseball game? No, that's a hockey game. All right. Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Prairie Creek Church. We're so glad you're here. We're so thankful for the rain. We forgot what that was. What's that wet stuff that's coming out of the sky? We're grateful. We've been praying for the rain, and uh, we need more. I know the farmers are asking God for more. So. so we're talking about how the gospel redeems our relationships today. Gets really practical, right? Um, and I'm going to read you a passage out of Colossians. That's not where we are today. We're going to be in Ephesians. But this is a, a passage that parallels the one we're going to be reading today. It sounds very familiar. It's probably because it came from the Apostle Paul. Colossians chapter 3, it says, As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. Bear with each other. Forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. As members of one body, you are called to peace. And be thankful. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Sound familiar, doesn't it? And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And then we get to the hard part that we're going to be talking about today. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as, as is fitting to the Lord. And husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. And fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. See, as God's chosen people who are filled with the Spirit of God, we're called to love each other and live in unity and harmony, and that includes in the family, in the church, in the culture, everywhere we go. Uh, see, the gospel affects our relationships. So why don't you stand this morning and worship with us. We're going to sing, All I Have is Christ. Once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy in life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will, and if you Lord, I would be yours 
listen home and live so all might see the strength to follow your commands could never come from me oh father use my ransom for us so that we can have new life so that we can say I am who you say I am who am I that the highest king would welcome me I was lost but you brought me his love for me, oh, his love for me, who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed, I'm a child of God, yes, I grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the Son sets free, always oh, free indeed. I'm a child
adopts us into his family and makes us his children. Praise God. All right, sing. let's sing, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus for my life. Savior, he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need his power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me through the Yeah. 
so grateful that you loved us and sent your son Jesus Christ the light of the world to come and shine in the darkness of our broken sin cursed world our broken sin cursed lives and to bring hope and light and life and so we declare today that our only hope is you Jesus that you are the giver of life you are the way the truth and the life and because of you not only can we be redeemed but you can redeem every part of our lives our, our relationships our marriages our homes our families our, our, our um, workplace, um, all, all in our church life, all of these areas that you want to make us new and uh, make us more like you, loving and kind and patient and gentle and compassionate. And so we, uh, forgiving and, and gracious and merciful. And so we need your help. We need your grace. We need your love poured out in our hearts so that we can be filled with you and love like you and live like you and uh, act and react like you so that we can redeem uh, the people around us for the glory of God. Thank you for this time together this morning. I pray that you'd be with us this morning as we hear from your word. I pray that you'd speak through me, fill me with your spirit, give me your strength today to declare your truth to your people for your glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be seated. If you've got little ones, now's the time for them to head down to kids' church. Thanks, Amanda. Got some great workers down there that will take care of your kids and also give them an age-appropriate lesson. All right, looks like a good time. Just would ask for your prayers this morning for me and my family. We uh, were able to go up and visit Mia for a couple days uh, up in uh, Stevens Point, Wisconsin. She's uh, interning at a large EV free church up there, and she's uh, working in the children's ministry of several hundred students. And so she's getting a lot of great experience and training there, and she's learning a lot. We got to go up and hang out with her and see her special friend as well. Get to spend a little bit of time with him. Getting to know him, it's really important to me. Um, but on the way back, we stopped at a little Mexican restaurant and something went bad. And so uh, myself and half of my family, including my wife, were um, had a rough night. Let's just put it that way. Um, and so that's why my wife and kids aren't, well, Ethan, good job for you. He's the one that didn't go with us. He didn't eat any of that Mexican food, so... You dodged a bullet, son, but the rest of the family is down for the count, so be, please be praying for them. When I left the house this morning, me, Amy was in the bathroom, so I couldn't even say goodbye. But, uh, um, yeah, just remember her and all the little ones because they're not feeling great this morning. Well, we are continuing in our discussion, our study, if you will, of the book or the letter of Ephesians, starting out with who we are in Christ, and then... Uh, in the last few chapters, we've gotten really practical about how our identity in Christ, as we were singing about earlier, our identity in Christ affects how we live and affects all of our relationships. And this week, we're going to be talking about that most important relationship, marriage. And this happens to be actually one of the most important passages. Ephesians 5, uh, 22 through 32 happens to be both the lengthiest and also the most important passage in all of the Bible on marriage. And to be honest with you, I've been dreading it a little bit. You know how I told you that whenever I preach on a particular subject, uh, invariably whatever I'm preaching about, God gives me an opportunity to, uh, that week to practice what I'm preaching or not. And this week has been no different. Um, Amy and I have had some interesting conversations this week, and so it's very humbling. Uh, so uh, watch out for next week, kids, because uh, I'm, I'm preaching on parenting. And uh, so my kids are going to have some challenges this week, I'm sure. Um, another reason I I'm, have been dreading this somewhat, it's, it's actually one of the great passages in all of Scripture, but it does address the passage, uh, it does address the subject of gender roles in marriage, which obviously today is a very contentious and controversial subject. Uh, 
marriage is a glorious paradox. It's one of life's greatest joys, yet also it can be one of life's sources of deepest hurt as well. I mean, no one can hurt you like your spouse can. Uh, in fact, I was talking about this with Amy this week, and I actually used the analogy of war, um, that I feel like I'm in a war, not just with her, but in general. And one of the battles is our marriage, one of the battlefields, if you will. I feel like I'm fighting, and our, our, our marriage is one of the battlefields in which I'm fighting. And, and marriage can sometimes feel like that, like a battle that we're fighting, and, and, and we're in it for our lives. You know, there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears and, uh, and, and we suffer humbling defeats in our marriages, and we also celebrate exhausting victories in our marriages. Uh, the, the reality is, and the truth is, there are no fairy tale marriages. Sorry, Wayne and Rebecca, you know, you guys started just last week, and you're like, come on, I want some good news. But there are no fairy tale marriages. Um, yet, there is no human relationship that is greater or more important than marriage. I mean, God himself designed and established marriage and even officiated the first wedding in Genesis chapter 2. And when God made the woman and brought her to the man, Adam exclaimed, At last, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, declaring how significant and wonderful that God intended the marriage relationship to be between husband and wife. In fact, next to our relationship with God, marriage is the most profound relationship that there is. And in Genesis 1, we learn that God created the man and the woman, male and female, in his image and for his glory. And in his good design for human flourishing, he instituted, designed marriage in which a man leaves his father and mother, is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. And God blessed their marriage, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and rule over it. And God goes out of his way, and this is so important in Genesis chapter 1, God goes out of his way to say that both male and female, both man and woman, are created in the image of God. And that means, again, that both are equal in essence, equal in status, equal, uh, therefore, in equal value and worth uh, and dignity in God's sight. And so men and women, though different are equally important, equally valuable in the eyes of God. In fact, it is uh, the Bible, the scripture, Christianity itself that gives, uh, it's where human dignity comes from. It comes from God. Human, di human dignity depends upon uh, Christianity for its existence. There's no other worldview out there that provides a uh, uh, a sound basis and foundation for human, human dignity and value and worth. Ask somebody sometime that, that's not a Christian. Ask them, what is the basis for human dignity and worth? They can't give it to you. If they give you some kind of a relative, well, it's a you know, social construct, and we ascribe value to one another, or we ascribe value to ourselves. Uh, but in the biblical worldview, the Christian worldview, God creates us in his image with inherent dignity, with inherent value, with inherent worth. And this truth elevates um, both male and female. And it also eliminates uh, uh, feelings of superiority and inferiority, that one sex is better than the other. Um, it doesn't pit the sexes against each other. It brings them together for mutual harmony and benefit and mutual fulfillment. And this uh, view of male and female, man and woman, being created in the image of God, every human being on this planet bears the image of their creator. And, and this has a powerful impact on how we view each other and how we relate to each other and interact with one another. Because we can either choose to see each other as God sees us, as special creations of his who bear his image and, and are therefore worthy of respect and love and honor and dignity, or not. And so marriage, uh, biblical marriage, Christian marriage, is a call to love and cherish one another and to treat each other as God treats us, with respect and love and honor and dignity. In fact, God goes so far as to say that we violate the glory of our creator in each other when we fail to see each other as God sees us. When, uh, at, who are equal in value, equal in personhood, equal in dignity, equal in glory. We actually degrade one another when we treat each other without love and without respect and without honor as an object to be used for our own gratification or to be despised or to be taken advantage of and exploited. 
we actually dishonor the very glory of God and one another when we do that. And so that's a really healthy, sound basis for human relationships, particularly marriage. So it's important to note that, that the two passages that we're going to, we, I just brought up Genesis 1 and 2, and then here we are today in Genesis chapter, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 5. These are two very key passages in all of the scripture, foundational to the basic principles of marriage that was instituted. First of all, they tell us these two things, these two very important things, that Marriage was instituted by God himself and that it was designed to be a reflection of the redeeming love of God for us in Jesus Christ. And that is why, by the way, apart from the gospel, marriage is challenging, right? Because the gospel helps us to understand marriage and marriage helps us to understand the gospel. And apart from receiving the love and grace and mercy and forgiveness of of Christ, it's really challenging to offer that same love and mercy and grace and forgiveness to each other. So marriage really helps us to understand the gospel, and the gospel helps us to understand marriage. So I want to begin today where we left off last week to get a running start on this passage. So why don't we go to the first slide, and this is where we ended last week, okay? Um, And uh, where Paul tells believers uh, that We who have been chosen by God, uh, indwelled by his spirit, redeemed by Jesus, and been filled by the Holy Spirit will be marked with submission in divinely ordered relationships. He says, listen, don't, don't be drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That sounded like that Colossians 3 passage we read this morning. Uh, Singing and making music with your heart to the Lord giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's that's what Christians do. That's how Christians relate to one another. Um, And so our lives will be marked by submission within divinely ordered relationships when we're walking in the Spirit. So that word, though, is not a word that we use much uh, unless you're a fan of, of wrestling, when then you talk about submission, but that is not the context that we're talking about here. Um, I want uh, to submit, the word actual, the biblical word submit actually means to arrange or to order oneself under a leader. To arrange or order oneself under a leader. And in this context here, in Paul's writing, the, the result is the, Christ, the, the, the context is the biblical Christian community, the church, the family of God. And so it's the result of believers being filled with the Holy Spirit. And what results from that is voluntary submission to one another in the Christian community. And this requires us to have an attitude of humility and self-denial and a concern for the needs of others uh, as an essential part of what it means to live as a Christian within the community of faith, within the community, the family of God, the community of believers. At the same time, it affirms that spirit-filled Christian relationships are ordered with distinctive role obligations in the various spheres of home and work and church and state. Improperly ordered relationships actually hinder the work of the spirit in and through the church. Contrast that with the culture around us where unbelievers tend to take great pride in individualism and independence, and these things lead to selfishness and self-centeredness which is the great enemy of marriage. The greatest enemy of marriage is sinful self-centeredness. And that's why spirit-filled believers are to live counterculturally by, according to Philippians chapter 2, Paul says, having the attitude uh, that Christ had, where we do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, that's pride or arrogance or selfishness. Rather, in humility, we value each other above ourselves. It's not talking about inferiority, superiority. It's just looking to their needs first. It's a you before me attitude. Not looking to your own interest, but also be to the interest of the others. But uh, I've heard this, and this is interpreted often as we go into the very next passage where it talks about wives submitting to husbands. Um, Many uh, people say submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ is talking about mutual submission where we're all supposed to mutually submit to one another. But is this to be understood as mutual submission? And the question is, if so, if that's what that means, then how does one know when and to whom and in what areas that we're to submit? I'll give you an example. If, if somebody in here were to uh, 
if a certain person were to submit to another person in here, person A or person B, then B would not be submitting, but then would be leading. And if how, how is mutual submission possible? Somebody has to lead, right? And somebody has to follow. Um, so the, in the context, verse 21 is best understood as a general heading that encourages spirit-filled spirit -filled believers to be humbly and voluntarily submissive to those in leadership roles, to those who are called to lead. And the following verses specify the, the, the relationships and the ways in which Christians are submit to one another. In this case, uh, wives to husbands, children to parents, servants to masters. We're going to get into that in a couple weeks. But none of the relationships that are discussed in these ordered, divinely ordered relationships, in none of them, um, and some 40 times in the New Testament that this word submit is used, and none of them are reversed. In other words, there's no place in the New Testament where husbands are told to submit to their wives. There's no place where parents are told to submit to their children. There's no place where government is supposed to submit to the citizens or disciples to demons. Uh, those are some of the references. So submit doesn't describe a, a, a symmetrical relationship since it always carries the tone of authority. There are, or, again, ordering yourself under a leader in which one person is over and another is under. So given the language here in the context of verse 21, this verse right here, Paul is urging believers to be submissive to those who are in authority over them. And now he's going to begin to unpack the specifics of how those particular relationships are to be ordered in the next verses. So let's go ahead and go to verse 22, and this is where we start today. Um, so we have God creating male and female, equal in value, equal in worth, equal in dignity, before God, equal in status and standing before God. But, as we're going to see in the following verses, they have differing roles in marriage. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Uh, he's the Savior of the body. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. So this is the first of three sets of relationships in which spirit-filled believers are to reflect their love and devotion to their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and uh, their submission to him as their king by living rightly under the authorities that he's established, both in the home and in the church and in the workplace and in the, in, uh, as citizens of the state. So wherever you fall on this spectrum, and there are good Christians who have different views of what this passage means and what... Um, it means for the wife to submit and what it means for the husband to be the head of the wife. Wherever you fall on the interpretive spectrum, acknowledging the differences between men and women is unavoidable in marriage. Uh, as much as our culture and our society tries to do this, men and women are not interchangeable. It doesn't mean that they can't do some of the same things, but they're not meant to be interchangeable. They're, they are different, distinctively different. God intended it to be so when he made them. God didn't create generic humans and uh, only later differentiating them. Rather, from the very beginning, God made us male and female. And so every single cell in your body is either stamped with an XX or XY chromosome. And, and because gender is not a social construct, but a created design by our creator, uh, and it's the very heart of our nature by design, God has something to say about our created purpose and, and the created order in which we are to live in relationship with one another. And we already noted that because both men and women are created in the image of God, both have equal importance, equal value, with neither being inferior or superior. That's not what this passage is talking about. Um, but we do also see that in creation, um, that, that these roles came from the beginning of creation starting with the created order that Adam was created first. And in fact, enough time passed uh, before the creation of woman for Adam to notice that she was missing. Uh, he was given the responsibility by God to name the animals, and with that, the authority to name the animals. Um, and as he's going through and, and collating and naming all the animals, he noticed that there was no one like him, no one fit for him. There was no corresponding uh, uh, mate for him or helper for him. And God for the first time in uh, the Genesis account, said, it is not good. He's been saying all along, it is good, it is good, uh, it is very good. And for the first time, he said, it is not good. And what did he say that was not good? He said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper corresponding or fit for him. Now, the Hebrew word 
helper here is Acer. Acer. It's not denigrating in any way, uh, like a, somehow a, a, a lesser role. In fact, in the Bible, the word Acer or helper is often, most often used referring to God himself. Um, it's used many times in the Old Testament and almost, almost always it's used in reference to God. Uh, God is our ever-present help in time of need. I will look to the hills from where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. He is an Acer, a helper, the one who makes up what is lacking in my strength when I am weak. He's, uh, it's often used as a, a, in a military term as reinforcements, right? So the woman was created by God to be a Acer, a helper like God, a strong helper like God himself. She was created to be the perfect reinforcing complement, the perfect fit for her husband, for Adam, like two pieces of a puzzle fit together so that they can create a complete whole. That's the idea, a helper that is fit for him. And yet the fact remains that the person doing the helping does put herself in a subordinating role to the one who was given the response, primary responsibility for the task. Both of them were given the responsibility to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and to rule over it. Uh, but this was God's created design with differing roles even before uh, their sin and the disobedience that brought the curse. You know, some would have you believe that the distinction in roles happened after the fall only after the fall, but that's not true. They had distinctive roles when they were created by God and when they were working in the garden together. God had established leadership and authority roles within the family already, uh, with Adam taking the lead and Eve's submission to her husband as a humble, voluntary recognition and respect of that God-given divine order for their marriage. And the reason why a wife is called to submit to her husband is because God has established the husband as the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. And the language here for head or headship signifies leadership and authority, not superiority, but a lead role. Uh, headship is the divine calling of a husband to take primary responsibility for Christ-like servant leadership, protection, and provision in the home. And it was expressed, uh, this, this servant leadership this headship is to express care and devotion and nur nurturing and nourishment. The husband's headship and the wife's submission were to create this unity and harmony in the home as they worked together uh, for human flourishing. And the husband was to protect his wife uh, in times of danger, both physically and spiritually. And we, we understand that this, this takes place all the time, um, this idea of of differing uh, ordered relationships, even in the culture that we live in. I played on a basketball team, um, and um, we all had different roles on the team. Uh, coach did not want me to bring the ball up the court. He did not want me dribbling the ball up the court. That was not my job. That was not my role. It's not because the point guard was, actually, he was better at dribbling than I was, but, uh, but that was his role. Um, uh, and the shooting guard, got, coach didn't want me shooting three-pointers. Uh, he wanted me playing underneath the basket, uh, rebounding and shooting close to the basket. Um, and we all had different roles on the team, and we all knew what our roles were. And if we forgot, and I would occasionally chuck up a three-pointer, uh, coach would remind me that I wasn't the guy for that, and we had guys on the team to do that. He usually would remind me when I was sitting next to him when he pulled me off the court. Um, the funny thing about all that is that our coach was, we were all bigger than him. We all towered over him. In fact, whenever we would go into, you know, a restaurant or whatever, they, they go, hey, we know who the coach is. You know, he's this short guy. And uh, we would all towel over. But it was funny. We'd come off, off, uh, off the court for timeouts, and our coach would call a timeout, and he's all getting in our faces and, and uh, telling us what we did wrong and what we need to correct, and we're all listening around. I'm like, yeah, coach, yeah, coach. Each one of us could pick him up and throw him across the room. Um, and yet here's the, the small guy telling all the big guys, uh, how, how it was going to go because we knew our role and we knew that he was the leader, he was the coach, and we voluntarily, willingly submitted ourselves under his authority. And uh, that's how life works in, in the workplace, uh, in society, in government, um, in, in the workplace. There's bosses, there's employers, and there's employees. Um, this is how life works. But when it comes to marriage, we find ourselves balking at the idea because it feels um, not culturally relevant, I guess. 
Um, but when Paul wrote this back in the first century Ephesus, uh, it was culturally very similar to our culture today. Divorce and adultery were rampant in Ephesus. Marriage was suffering a complete da- breakdown. Uh, many couples uh, were embracing a lifestyle of independence with little, if any, commitment to one another. There was all kinds of infidelity going on. Women in Ephesus and men were increasingly rejecting the home and and the women were increasingly rejecting the traditional Roman ultra-authoritarian male leadership that was practiced in the homes uh, at, at the beginning of the Roman Empire. Um, and so Paul's words were connecting male headship to God and to Christ must have seemed hard for them to receive and crazy and ludicrous to the Ephesians because they worshipped the goddess Artemis or Diana. The Artemis was what the Greeks called her. Diana is what the Romans called her. And, uh, and so they felt liberated to participate in all the uh, male and female shrine prostitution that was going on around the worship of Artemis. And so um, Paul challenged the Corinthians on the same issue because the Corinthians were struggling with the same thing in their culture. In 1 Corinthians 11, chapter, chapter 11, verse 3, Paul says, I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. There's divine order. There's ordered relationships to work as God intended and designed them to work. So the challenge with this whole concept of submission is in our culture, there's an increasing s- scrutiny that is being placed on those who are said to have more power or privilege or status because the assumption is that those with power or privilege or status will always yield it to their own ava- advantage and will always use it to oppress others. And that's, that's a legitimate danger. There's a constant danger for anyone in a position or role of authority uh, to abuse it and to become a domineering tyrant. And that's the great fear of those who would submit themselves under that authority um, that their husband or their boss or whatever would be Come a domineering tyrant or their coach. Um, th- th- there, there's a fear that, that the leader's sinful self-centeredness, which we already said is the ultimate enemy of marriage, that the husband's self-centeredness, sinful self-centeredness, would cause him to selfishly seek his own best interest without considering uh, how the decisions made would affect those under his authority. That's what uh, tyrants do. Domineering tyrants exploit others for their own gain. But Jesus said that is not how leadership works in the family of God. In my kingdom, authority is not synonymous with tyranny. In fact, Jesus redefined authority as servant leadership. In God's kingdom, those who are entrusted with the power and authority of leadership are called to love, serve, and empower those entrusted to their care. And Jesus' disciples were jockeying for position in his kingdom. And they were arguing over which one of them was the greatest. Jesus confronted them and said, You know that the, the, the rulers of the Gentiles, in the, uh, the, the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. And those in high positions act as tyrants over them. But it must not be like that among you, my followers. On the contrary, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He used himself as the ultimate example. He says, I came, and I'm the God, I'm the creator. And I humbled myself, took upon myself a uh, uh, form of a human being, and humbled myself to serve, not to be served, and to lay my life down for many. In fact, on the night that Christ was betrayed on the Last Supper, They're all coming into the upper room, he and his disciples. Jesus, the Son of God, modeled for his disciples what servant leadership looked like. He got up from the table, he took off his robe, he wrapped a towel around his waist, he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he had around him. This was, in that culture, the job of the lowliest slave in the house. It was the worst job ever, right? Washing the the day's nastiness off the feet. of of the people who entered the home. Um, And they were traveling in the streets, you know, with sometimes barefoot, sometimes with open-toed sandals, and the sewage and the refuse that was in the streets would uh, be 
on their feet and the servant would have to wash all this off. What a humbling job. And Jesus took up the towel in the basin and began to wash his own disciples' feet. Um, and they resisted. That's, you, that's beneath you, Jesus. You shouldn't be doing this. But after washing their feet, he put on his robe again and he sat down and said, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord. And, and you're right. It's because that's what I am. I am your master. I am your Lord. And since as your Lord and master, I have washed your feet, now you also ought to wash each other's feet. I've given you an example to follow, Jesus said. Do as I have done to you. Because I tell you the truth, slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Isn't that astonishing? The master, the creator of the universe, had made himself a servant in the most dramatic act of selfless love. And that's how the head of the church serves his body, the church. He lays his life down for it, humbly serving uh, the church for their good, for their benefit. And Christ-like leaders, Christ-like husbands, love and serve those under their authority and lay their lives down for them. See, in Jesus, we see authoritarianism laid aside and the humility of submission glorified. This is what it looks like in the body of Christ. So the motivation for the wife's submission here, as Paul says, is to be done as to the Lord. So as she voluntarily submits to her husband, in that very act, she's submitting to her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. She's showing her love and devotion to Christ by uh, responding rightly to the, to, the, to the relationships that he's ordered in the home and in the marriage and the family. It's interesting enough. So Jesus is the example of loving servant leadership. We're going to get to that in a moment with the, with the husband's role. But he, interestingly enough, he also is the example of humble submission to authority. In Philippians 2, which we read a portion of earlier, Paul tells us that God the Son didn't exploit his equality with his Father in heaven. He was sitting at the right hand of the authority, position of honor and authority and status, equal in status and nature with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But instead, he laid aside his glory and willingly submitted to the will of the Father. <clears throat> and he's, and, and Philipp, Paul says in Philippians 2, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset that Christ Jesus had, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. He modeled what humble submission to the Father. It's an interesting, you could do a little study on submission in the Godhead, how obviously the Father takes a lead role, and the Son and the Spirit take a subordinating role, a submissive role. Do you think for a moment that Jesus felt that the Father was oppressing him? That the Father was taking advantage of him? That he was afraid that if I, if I humble myself and submit to the will of the Father, that he's going to ask me to do something that's going to harm me? Not for a minute. Why? Because he knew that the Father loved him and that the Father's will was good. And he could trust that. Adam and Eve's sin and the curse that came as a result of their disobedience brought with it a corruption of the good um, purposes and design God intended for marriage. And it, and it distorted the God-given roles in marriage. It didn't change the roles. The roles were still there, but it distorted them. It, it, it uh, corrupted them. It, it, to use the word perverted them, if you will. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, God said to the woman, as he's pronouncing the curse because of their disobedience and the rebellion against God, <clears throat> God said to the woman, I will intensify your labor pains and you will bear children with painful effort. And your desire will be for your husband and he will rule, yet he will rule over you. The word desire here, your desire will be for your husband, implies an aggressive desire against or in opposition to her husband that would bring her into conflict with him. <clears throat> it's the impulse to oppose or to conquer or to rule over or to control him. And this sinful desire is part of the consequences of the fall into sin, the disobedience and of the curse. This sinful desire would, be, would bring pain and conflict into the marriage relationship. <clears throat> As the husband himself had his own issues, 
His sinful self-centeredness would cause him to lean towards sinful aggression or on one hand or sinful passivity on the other to his wife's impulse to oppose and to control him. And so you have this battle, the war of the sex is this battle for control that happened as a result of uh, the curse of sin. But it did not change God's intent and purpose. It did not change God's intent and purpose for marriage. But the good news is that's not the end of the story. God loved us and sent his son Jesus to come into the world to redeem our broken relationships and our sinful relationships and to set us free from the tyranny of sin in our own lives so that we can say yes to God and no to our own sinful impulses and walk in obedience to God's good design. So the gospel is Jesus' answer to the objection that biblical submission in marriage is inherently oppressive. In fact, I would submit to you that biblical submission in marriage, that God's... um, uh, good purposes for marriage actually has elevated the plight of women wherever Christianity has gone. If you look at right now the places in the world where women truly are treated as second-class citizens or worse, as property, and they really are oppressed and abused, it's where the, go- the light of the gospel is not, um, is not shining, is not in, in charge, where you see darkness in the world where man has his own way, man's sinful oppression uh, is to uh, take other people and to oppress them, oppress them and exploit them for his own good purposes. But in God's uh, good purposes, uh, his divine order, uh, the new kingdom of heaven, the new covenant that Jesus instituted through the gospel is to elevate the role of women, to elevate the status of women um, and to honor them and to give them a place both in uh, the family and in the church and in uh, society. And so um, the gospel is answer is God's answer to uh, the objection that biblical submission in marriage is inherently oppressive. In fact, the beautiful example of Christ's redemptive relationships with his church is the example that he gave, uh, that as Christ loves his church and as the church submits to Christ, this is to be the picture, the model for Biblical Christian marriage. If, if the wife's role of respectful submission to her husband is analogous to Christ's respectful submission to his father and the church's respectful submission to Christ, then wives need not fear that their submission will be either demeaning or dangerous for them and put them at risk. Why? Because uh, Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And now we're going to see in verse 25, let's go to the next slide, that husbands are to love their wives in that same way, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Excuse me for a second. So immediately after Paul instructs wives to submit to their husbands, he commands husbands to love their wives in the same way that Christ loved the church. He says, wives, I'm not going to put you at risk. I'm not going to have you be uh, uh, oppressed or subjugated in an unhealthy, unholy way um, because I'm calling husbands to love and lead you as Christ loves and leads his church. And what he means here is that husbands are to do for their wives what Christ himself did for us. And what did Christ do for us? Anyone? Anyone? He died for us. He laid his life down for us, right? He willingly sacrificed himself and laid his life down for us. And Jesus said, no, there is no greater love than this. Laying your life down for another is the ultimate expression of this you before me selfless love, this kind of love, this kind of attitude that Christ has for his church and that we are commanded that husbands are commanded to have for their wives the word is uh, the the kind of love here that Paul is discussing or describing is that agape love the verb is agapao which means to love unconditionally to love irrespective of merit Uh, uh, regardless of whether someone is deserving or unloving back It's not conditional upon any of those things. It's a love that gives and doesn't takes. Its intent is to seek the highest good of the one loved. Just as the wife's submission is not dependent upon her husband's response, so a husband's love is not dependent upon his wife's response. He's supposed to love unconditionally. 
no strings attached. I love you in spite of how you respond to me. Neither are to be governed by their emotions or their feelings, but by an act of the will. That's what love is. Love is, is not just a feeling that you fall into and fall out. It's an act of the will. It's a choice. It's a decision. And when a husband chooses to love his wife as Christ loves the church, he will not be overbearing. He will not act unilaterally in his own best interest at her expense. His life will be characterized by self-giving love and by forgiveness and by loving care and nurture and protection. And what, is, what does uh, Paul say here is the goal of this kind of love? When husbands love their wives, wives as Christ loved the church, the goal of this unconditional love is to make his wife holy. It's interesting, right? To make your wife holy, uh, to sanctify her, some of your translations have. That is, to set her apart from sin, to help her grow in purity from all that is unclean, to cleanse, cleanse her and help her become pure and holy, set apart from evil, set apart from sin. And then the second part is to be set apart from sin to God, uh, consecrated to God and His will and His good purposes for her life. And this happens, according to Paul here, through the cleansing by the washing with water through the Word. It's a metaphor for an Old Testament uh, Jewish marital custom, the bridal bath. Um, in Ezekiel 16, God called Israel, his people, his bride. And he painted a picture of uh, bathing her filthiness with water and soap and anointing her with perfume and uh, bath oils and clothing her with in magnificent, brilliant, beautiful white clothes so that her splendor would radiate unsurpassed and matchless and breathtaking in her, in her beauty as a bride adorned for her husband. Um, all of this was painting a picture that this is what God wants to do with his people is to uh, sanctify us and to make us pure and holy, signifying our purity. And this is accom uh, accomplished spiritually first through receiving God's grace and mercy and forgiveness, believing the gospel. And then, secondly, through the renewing and washing and purifying with the Word of God. It's been fun to come alongside some of, some of you, even here in this room, and see you first come to Christ and uh, first begin to ask questions. What does that mean for me now as a believer to, to walk in accordance with who I am now in Christ and, and to be, begin the process of sanctification, of putting off the old habits and putting on the new fruits of the Spirit like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control and forgiveness and mercy and grace and all of these things and to be becoming more and more pure and more and more holy and more and more like Jesus, right? So a husband is to encourage and take the lead and take the initiative in helping his wife and children become more and more like Jesus. And that means he has to first be like Jesus. Um, reading the Bible uh, with and to his wife and children, encouraging her in her walk, uh, and her obedience to Christ, encouraging her in that same process that he's participating in and putting off, he's leading by example, putting off the old sinful habits and putting on the fruit of the Spirit. Spiritual leadership in the home is, is part of this command to love your wife. And it's concerned for the spiritual, the husband is concerned for the spiritual welfare of his wife and his children. Husbands are to so love Christ and so love their wives and so love their children that his greatest desire for his wife is that she becomes like Jesus. And his greatest desire for his children is that they become like Jesus. And this leads him to uh, become more like Jesus himself, be put off more sin, become more holy, become more pure, and then to lead his wife and children to do the same. So that, that context, husbands love your wives, and uh, sanctify her with the washing of water through the word that you might present her radiant and spotless, uh, holy and blameless before God one day as a beautiful, radiant, holy bride. That's the context of the relationship in which a wife willingly and voluntarily orders herself under her husband's leadership. Wives, if you have a husband who will love you like that, like Christ loved his church, and gave, is constantly laying his life down for your benefit and your good, constantly saying, what can I do 
that will benefit her, her? What can decision? What decisions can we make as a family that will uh, enable and empower my wife to flourish and become more like Jesus? Well, that's the kind of husband you should be willing to follow. The redeeming love of Christ is the model for what this marriage relationship is to look like. And as the church gra- gladly submits to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and and we benefit from His His leadership of the church because it's Christ is the head of the church. Uh, It's not the pastor. It's not the elders. It's Christ who's the head of the church. And as we benefit from his headship, as we benefit from his leadership, as we enjoy his presence and receive his love, and we receive all the blessings and gifts that come from him, every spiritual blessing we have in Christ, and they lead to our flourishing, they lead to our benefit, they lead to our growth in Christ likeness and holiness, and we get to respond to him in submission, obedience, and love, and gratitude. That's the kind of dynamic that Christ is modeling for us and that he has called us to have in our marriages. And so, wives, the, the safety of knowing that your husband loves you so selflessly that he would rather die for you than dominate you or oppress you, that's the kind of Uh, confidence that we have in Christ as our head, as our leader, as our Savior, and as our Lord. That's the kind of confidence that Christ had in submitting to his Father. And so, wives, just as you have nothing to fear from your loving Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, a wife needs not fear the leadership of a husband who's rightly ordered under God's authority and submits to his rule in his life. And then husbands, according to Paul here and according to Christ here, you are to use your role, your position of authority or your your leadership to love and to serve your wife and kids and not yourself. You before me. Uh, Your leadership is for your wife's benefit and your children's benefit, not your own. You should not be asking, what's in this for me? But how can I love and serve you? Again, this is not the eros kind of love which is more like a lust. What can I take from you that will gratify my needs? It's not even a phileo, that brotherly love, phileo love, that's more of a conditional love, a contractual love. It's a give and take. You know, it's, we talk about this like marriage is a contract, 50-50. I, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. No, this is, this is agape love. This is God's unconditional love. It's self-sacrificing love. It, it gives and doesn't take. It gives rather than taking. And this is the kind of love that God had for us. And this is the kind of love uh, that he's called us to have for our wives, husbands. He goes on. He's not done. By the way, you might notice in this passage that the instruction to the husbands is more than twice as long as what he gave to the wives. Here we are in verse 28. Let's go to the next 28. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes it. He cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. So Paul's repeating and kind of repeating and driving his main point home. Husbands, love your wives. Why do you think he has to say this so much and over and over again? Because husbands need to hear it. We need to be reminded. Um, it doesn't come naturally to us. You know what comes naturally to us is to love ourselves and to seek our own good. And when Christ comes into our life and redeems our relationships, now it's a you before me. I die so that you can become who you can, who God's created and called you to be. I'm going to lay my life down for you so that I can empower you to be all that Christ has called you to be. Husbands are to love their lives like that, love their wives like that. At first, this may seem sound a little self-serving, right? When he says, Husbands love their wives as their own bodies. It might even seem uh, a little degrading to the wife. Like that's why he's loving me because he's thinking of me as his own body. Um, but think about this. The, when, when the rich young ruler came up to Jesus and asked him, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And what was the second one? Second one. She'll love your neighbor as yourself. She'll love your neighbor as as yourself. See, Jesus urged his disciples to treat each other, uh, uh, one another, as they themselves wanted to be treated or like to be treated. This is one of the most compelling descriptions of the oneness that should characterize Christian marriage. In other words, because uh, a husband and wife are one flesh, when the two become one, 
in marriage, they become one flesh, they're regarded as one soul or a, 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 a unity, one person, a single entity that the husband is now called to take care of and to nourish and cherish as his own body. His wife is part of him. And this nurture and tender care has to do with providing for her physically and spiritually and her relational needs and providing warm and tender affection in order to give her comfort and security and safety. Just as Christ does his church. Why? Because we're members of his body. We've been placed in Christ in that same sense, this unity, that Christ cares for himself as his body, as his bride. Husbands are to care for their... So this is a beautiful picture of Christ's love for his church and that union and communion that is involved there. In fact, the, the, the picture here is that Christ himself would be diminishing his own glory, which the church offers through submission and obedience if he didn't care for his church as his own body. I'm not sure that we've ever truly understood and experienced that kind of intimacy that Christ intends to have with us as his own body. Have you ever thought about that? Experience the tender affection that Christ has for you as not just uh, um, as sons and daughters of the, of the Father, um, but as members of his body. He loves and cares and nurtures us and feeling his tender affection for us as his church. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. And then we're going to close with the last couple verses in verse 31. For this reason, you've heard this passage before. This is a quoting of Genesis chapter 2. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. It's a profound mystery, Paul says. I'm talking about Christ and the church. Marriage is to be uh, a beautiful picture of this union and love and mutual um, love and submission of Christ and the church. So to sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. So Paul here is just reinforcing God's good plan for marriage. He's emphasizing this is God's good design. He established it all the way back in Genesis as uh, one man, one woman, become one flesh for one f lifetime. He's talking about its permanence and its unity here. The marriage union uh, is, is intimate. They become one-souled, and it's unbreakable. They are, to be, they are to hold fast to one another. They become united, uh, and they become one flesh, cemented together. And uh, Jesus would later say, what God has joined together in that kind of unity, let man not rip asunder, tearing the very flesh that had been joined together. What's this mean to leave mother, mother and father? It's, it's talking about... Um, Parents raising up their kids to become independent and to establish healthy marriages and healthy families like they've modeled for their kids, hopefully, right? Um, to let their kids go and to establish new family units who will also be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and rule over it. Um, their allegiance moves from, from one family to the new family, from mom and dad to husband and wife. Marriage is meant to be a sacred reflection of the beautiful mystery of the union between Jesus Christ and his bride, the church, this beautiful oneness we have in Christ, and the loving leadership that Christ provides um, and the loving, humble submission that, um, to that leadership by his people, the church. This is a beautiful picture of marriage. That's why Paul said your attitude should be the same of that of Jesus Christ who humbled himself, laid aside his rights, gave up his life for the church, and you should respond to him with joyful submission and obedience. Interesting here, the last statement that the wife is called to respect her husband. I would submit to you, wives, that as much as your husband appreciates it when you say, I love you, sweetie, um, and he does, uh, trust me, um, there's something unique about how God has wired up men to, to uh, need to be able to and to be empowered by a wife respecting her husband. You should just try that sometime. Um, instead of saying, I love you, which is totally appropriate, and you should say that regularly, um, say, you know, I want you to know that I respect you. Tell your husband that. First of all, you'll have to pick him up off the floor. Um, but after you do that, you say, I respect you. And, and usually, you know, don't make it up. Don't, don't be patronizing. See, an idea would be 
maybe you could tell him one thing you respect him for. I respect you for this. Um, and see what that does to your husband. See what that does to his soul. See what that does to him as a man. Um, uh, men are just wired up to need and desire respect from others. Uh, men get respect at work. Uh, uh, soldiers get respect uh, on the battlefield from their comrades in arms. Uh, pretty much, uh, men get respect in, in so many other places. The one place that they maybe find that sometimes respect is lacking is in their home and particularly from their wives. So you try that on for size, ladies. Tell your, tell your husbands, I respect you. Just do it once in a while um, and tell them what you respect them for and just see the effect that that has on him. Uh, he'll run through a brick wall for you. So what does servant leadership look like in practice? I just want to just unpack a couple practical things and then we're going to close with a song. Think about this for like in the home and marriage and decision making. When uh, uh, a husband does not love his wife like Christ loved the church and when his sinful self-centeredness takes over and he becomes sinfully aggressive, he can become harsh and domineering and tyrannical. He can give orders and demand, uh, demand control uh, and demand to make all the decisions. Uh, he's not interested in uh, taking feedback or questions or suggestions or better ideas. Just wants things done his way. Even discussion about the plan is a threat to him. It's my way or the highway, and that's final. Or he can go the other way and move to sinful passivity, abdicating his leadership, neglecting his responsibilities. He checks out, uh, refuses to uh, help and support and honor and love his wife, uh, doesn't discipline the children or engage uh, in home life. Um, by contrast, the servant leader, one who leads as Christ loves, loves and leads the church, the servant leader seeks to hear what his wife and his children think. He's willing to listen and have family discussions and be open to better alternatives, uh, even if they're not his ideas. In setting direction for the family, he takes the needs and concerns of each member into account. He considers how the choices will affect each one. His chief concern is to do what is best for everyone involved in the family. And that's a lot harder than just making a unilateral decision. It takes time. It takes energy. It takes relationships. It takes conversations. But it builds a healthy sense of teamwork into the family. Um, this is how, for the most part, Amy and I work. We have lots and lots and lots of conversations about decisions, about finances, about um, all kinds of things. Um, and you've got to have every topic on the table in order to be able to make healthy decisions for the benefit of the whole family. Um, a husband needs to understand the needs of his wife in order to be able to chart a course that's going to be for her benefit and in her best interest as well. But self-centered husbands aren't really interested in understanding their wife. They don't even really know very much about his wife or her interests or her needs. And he doesn't really have an intention to understand her needs. Uh, he doesn't respect her feelings. They don't even make sense to him. The servant leader is a student of his wife, however. He understands, he responds to her needs with love and sensitivity. He accepts that she's different from him. He doesn't patronize her or demean her because she's a woman. He seeks to understand her and her perspective. He listens when she talks about herself. His growing understanding of his wife leads to greater communication and intimacy in their marriage. And a servant leader encourages his wife to grow as an individual, affirming her gifts and abilities and helping her to grow be to become like Christ. In dealing with conflict, a self-centered husband becomes defensive when his wife challenges him with her own thoughts and perspectives. He views everything from a win-lose perspective. He can't stand to be wrong and would never admit it when he is. And so he browbeats his wife into going along with him. He manipulates her into granting his wishes. He may even physically intimidate her to get his way. And because he doesn't want to face his own weakness and insecurities, he tries to reassure himself that he's a real man by asserting his power in, in domineering and aggressive and violent ways. A servant leader, however, is more interested in arriving at the truth than who wins. 
He knows that his wife brings a valuable perspective and a sensitivity to many is issues that he does not understand. So he seeks her input. He values the relationship over being right, and together they work toward healthy compromise and resolution. A wife can also be sinfully aggressive when she resists and opposes her husband's leadership, not supporting him, but disrespecting him, fighting against him, creating conflict every step of the way. Or a wife can be sinfully passive rather than actively participating in family decisions, uh, contributing her insight and perspective that is vitally needed. She just goes along with what, whatever her husband says. She doesn't correct her children. She never objects when her husband becomes verbally or physically abusive. She never expresses her opinions or preferences. She just becomes a doormat. That's not healthy either. So a servant leader provides for his family. He works for the provision of their basic needs and keeps them out of debt and, and helps them stay on budget, right? He protects his wife and family. He accepts the responsibility of spiritual leadership in the family. He leads his family toward Jesus in uh, worshiping regularly and in the spiritual priorities and decisions uh, in the home, uh, prayer and family devotions. He's the first one to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me, to his wife and to his children. He discusses household responsibilities with his wife to make sure they're fairly distributed. He initiates and engages with his children, praying for them and playing with them and affirming and celebrating their victories and milestones, talking with them, reading to them, guarding against a schedule that would brutalize them and compromise the priorities of God and family time. He gives them practical instruction about life. He makes sure they can ride a bike and swim and read and play basketball. That's really important. I just threw that in. Interact in a healthy way with their peers and opposite sex. He honors his wife in front of them and makes his relationship with her a priority. The greatest gift you can give your children, parents, is a healthy marriage. So, husbands, as we kind of go through that, how are you doing? I want to encourage you, husbands, and just because, and I'm not just picking on you, husbands, but, but as the head of the home, the initiative starts with you. So I want to encourage you to go home and have a conversation with your wife and do a little 360 assessment of your leadership. Ask your wife, how it's, how's it going? And give her the green light. Tell her, I'm not going to get defensive and I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not going to tell you all the reasons that you're wrong. I'm just going to listen and hear you out. Ask her how you're doing in leading your home. You know, marriage doesn't create problems. It just reveals them. It reveals our sinful, selfish pride, our issues of anger and control. And, and those problems aren't necessarily problems with your spouse. They're ultimately God problems. The big, the big question here is, am I submitted to God, not am I submitted to my husband, am I loving my wife? The bigger question is, how's my relationship with God? Because if I'm submitting to him, then I'm going to do what he says in regards to my human relationships. Is, is he the Lord of my life? Has I placed my faith in Christ and received his grace and forgiveness and mercy so that he is, the gospel can transform me so that I can become the kind of man, the kind of husband, the kind of wife that God has called me to become? How can we be rightly related to our husbands or our wives if we're not first rightly related to God through the power of the gospel, receiving in, uh, God's forgiveness and mercy? So husbands, do you love your wife as Christ loved his bride, the church? And wives, do you respect your husbands? Do you willi willingly follow their leadership as you do Christ's leadership in your life? Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for the power of your word. I know these are challenging passages, but they're so important. That are so important for our human relationships. And this marriage of all the earthly relationships is by far the most important. It's more important than the child-parent relationship. It's more important than the employer-employee relationship. It's more important than the uh, responding to government authorities or work authorities. Um, uh, it's the most important relationship because it reflects the very nature and character of God. It reflects, the very, it reflects the Trinity. It reflects the love of God for his, the love of Christ for his church. So help us to order ourselves rightly under yours, your authority and to think rightly about our marriages and redeem them by your grace. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.
Why don't, we, why don't we get you to stand with us as we close with this song? This is an appropriate song to end on. I surrender. We surrender to the Lord, Lordship of Jesus Christ in our life and ask him to order our lives rightly under his authority for his glory. Jesus, breathe. 
going to take in it surrender to christ and his will in our lives pray that you'll do that and walk in it this week god bless you have a great week we'll see you next week lord willing